I'm Kaz Milligan, and this is my first few chapters. Right, I want to start this documentary off by my childhood and my upbringing, um, because I feel like my upbringing and my childhood has created the man I am today. Uh, through the good and the bad, some traumatic situations that's happened in my life has shaped me to be the man I am today, and I have some of my characteristics that I've got uh, for the better due to those bad situations that I've maybe been through emotionally, which I will tap into. I'm going to tap into all parts of my life um, that I've never told before on camera. Um, 2023, I want people to start taking me fucking serious because I have been having a laugh, trolling the haters and all of that stuff the past few years, but there's going to be a change in direction this year. Um, and it's time to take over. Right, so growing up, it uh, starts with my mum and dad. My mum and dad worked multiple jobs. They worked hard just to make ends meet. I grew up in a place called Methil, which is like a very small, small town. Um, I just surrounded by schemes. I feel like everybody's got this narrative or vision where I've grew up with money or in a fancy place, in a fancy area just because maybe I've done or I'm doing well myself and I look half decent, I take care of myself, but that's not the case. I've, I've not came from the worst places, of course not, but I'm just like most people. I've grew up in schemes, um, we've had financial issues, we've struggled, we've done too, not too bad. So growing up uh, around Methyl, Buckhaven and, and about all the schemes, um, gave me certain characteristics where it will keep me safe. So it was never the safest places. When I was growing back up, I feel like it's not as bad now, but when I was growing up, on a weekly basis, we were running from blades, from knives, from the local gangs and stuff like that. And I feel like since that became such a norm to us, um, it made us aware in other situations growing up uh, to somewhere some kids might be oblivious to some situations. So I always try and take the bad and negative situations and look at them in a positive way and in a positive light. Um, but then it takes us to school now. Uh, everybody knows if you've been watching my journey or maybe even tapping into podcasts that I've maybe been on. I've never been a fan of school. I never liked school. I feel like school and teachers never understood me as a pupil uh, or as an individual, as a human being, in fact. Um, I was always misunderstood. Uh, I had friends. I was always like pretty popular and stuff like that. So it wasn't like a bullying side, but it was a side where um, a new school was never going to be for me, a new school was never really going to help my career. Of course, you need the basics, the basic English, basic maths, stuff like that, and the common knowledge and um, the communication skills. But when it comes to the later years, maybe fourth, fifth year and stuff like that, I knew that school wasn't for me. It wasn't going to serve the purpose that it had for other pupils. Um, with my entrepreneurial mindset and the way I grew up. I feel like teachers back then, this was maybe 15, 17 years ago or whatever, um, they weren't uh, open to the local kids maybe having opportunities in the future to where we are now to realise that they could strive on to be millionaires or build massive businesses. And I'm not saying that I'm there yet, but I'm still on my journey. Um, and you've watched the journey so far unfold and it's only going to get better so everybody needs to stay tuned and for the teachers i know some of them are watching and i hope they're proud man because i still feel like i've still got a bit bad blood from the school experiences that i had um just from being misunderstood and then it caused me to sort of misbehave uh, i remember when i was even in school as well i think i was 13 or so I had my first entrepreneurial experience. So I hung about with older boys. It was maybe three, four years older than me growing up. And they were heading to a house party. They were hosting a house party. 
So it was my first time really drinking and I had four strongbows. Uh, and I remember going there, drinking one and selling the other three for £15 in a Mars bar. And I remember the Monday after that, my dad was taking me to school. And I says to my dad about the situation, I was like, look, I just sold this, made this money and blah, blah, blah. And my dad was like, you're going to be an entrepreneur when you're older. And I still remember it to this day. I was like, what's an entrepreneur? Um, and for years, I never really knew what an entrepreneur was until you get old enough to do your own research and uh, figure it out. And here I am today, an entrepreneur. But that leads me on to the business class when I was maybe 14. We were in business class and the business teacher said to us to write down what we were wanting to make as a salary when we were older, like our salary goal uh, as an adult. And I remember writing down 50K and me knowing 50K is a lot of money. I understand that. But I still knew as a 14 year old kid that I was going to surpass that uh, massively. And I remember when I showed her the 50K, she started laughing. She showed the rest of the class and she made it, she made me feel like I was unachievable. But I knew myself that I was going to surpass that anyway, but I just feel bad that maybe in another situation, if that was another kid without my mindset, straight away she's just went away and crushed their whole thought system, their whole future uh, and their beliefs to where they were wanting to be. The whole school experience, it drove me to want to show the kids now that they can achieve anything that they put their mind to. I don't want another pupil growing up in school being taught that they need to be average or even below average sometimes. Uh, I want the kids that have got a dream to hold on to it. Um, so that's why you'll see me going into schools, local schools, and hopefully in the future I'll branch out um, to much more schools and I'll go in, I'll try and inspire the kids. And if they've got a bunch of questions, I'll always answer it. I'll try and go into the schools and give them some free clothes and just give back however I can. And if I've got, say, 40, 50 kids standing in front of me and I change one kid's life or even thought process or inspire them in any way, I'm walking away from that school happy. I know that that's maybe what I needed growing up. I maybe needed that person to come into the school and say that shit to me. Um, and I maybe would have figured shit out a wee bit faster than what I did. As I was growing up, I did have some day in my life where I feel like could have pushed me to the next level, to the point where um, I feel like life could have been a much easier ride through my teenage years. Not a lot, in fact, nobody knows this. I've kept this secret my whole life. I tried opening up maybe when I was like 24, 25, which was only a year, two years ago. And I started maybe telling my close friends about it. But I held this to me, close to me, my whole life. Uh, I actually had two big brothers growing up. I've still got my biggest brother, who I love, um, Arden, Arden Milligan. Um, but I had a bigger brother. I'm not going to name any names, but he, he was my hero, like, growing up. I always looked up to him. He was like, the coolest guy in the world to me. And uh, he was always around the house. He was always inspiring me. And he was like my superhero. And um, one day when I was 11, 12 maybe, I don't even know exactly because I buried, I tried burying these memories for over a decade. And uh, I remember my last memory, my last memory with him, he told me that he was going to take me football training. So I had my football boots in my bag, standing at my window, waiting on him. And he never turned up and I've never seen him since. He disappeared. I just never understood as a kid especially how anybody could leave a loved one behind, if that makes sense. 
I don't know if he's maybe got his situations or his reasons, but I never want to hear them. I never want to hear his excuses. I hated the uh, superheroes as well, because since he was mine and he left me, he had gave me gave me basically no hope for me to look up to anybody again. It drummed into me and my life that loyalty is the biggest thing. Um, people that know me as well know that loyalty is the biggest thing in my life. I've got to stay loyal tattooed on my hand um, just to remind myself as well to never become that guy that maybe leaves somebody behind that looks up to me. Um, I tried ignoring all the emotions for, as I say, over a decade. I tried to keep myself busy. I never wanted to think about it. Um, it wasn't until I was 24 when I became sober, which I'll t touch into later on. I actually paused my life and it gave me an opportunity to reflect on my upbringing. Uh, and not even my upbringing, but reflect on my teenage years and maybe why I started misbehaving or going down a certain path that I went down and it was maybe because, uh, it was maybe because of him. Um, I would never put the full blame on anybody else, of course not, but as a kid, growing up with that hero and growing up with that inspiration, I mean, It was hard because there was no explanation why, there was no warning. It was just, when's he coming? When's he coming? Weeks went by, months went by, years went by, and then the next thing I knew, it was over a decade later, and that's when I realised that I'll never want to hear his reasons, his excuses. Um, and as I say, there's probably, there's maybe more to it, but I mean, it's past, it's past it. I've never want to put my energy into that. Um, um, but before I got to the age where I was able to pause my life and uh, reflect on maybe my teenage years and stuff, I want to talk to the lead up to where I was maybe 20 years old. When I was 20 or 21 years old, I started uh, chasing my dream. I thought, right, I've started my 20s, I need a career. Um, because prior to that, I was labouring, uh, working all on, working on all the construction sites. I was a pipe fitter, working on chemical plants, working 12 hour shifts, seven days a week. And that's what annoys me when people say, oh, you don't know what real graft is. Because I can guarantee you before me choosing this career, even way back when I was a pipe fitter or whatever I was doing, I could still guarantee I was working harder than every single 40, 50 year old that says that to me now. Um, but then I just couldn't, I couldn't carry on with that life and I had to start chasing my dream. And that's something I always tell kids, and not even kids, anybody, all ages, to if you're not happy in your job and you're not happy with the career you've got, it's never too late to try and figure out something. Um, put a plan together and chase whatever your dream was. I've got chase your dreams tattooed across my, my collarbones and again that's a message that I'm on a mission to try and spread to everybody uh, around the world to, to chase your dreams. In 2016 or 2017 um, I started modelling. Uh, I got asked to model down London a few times which I went down and done. Uh, bearing in mind I had no money at this point. Uh, I had my 
mum and dad asked for help to maybe pay for a train, uh, a train ticket or whatever it may be to just try and help me get to London to gain this experience. And when I was down London for one of the shoots for a weekend, um, my old boss in the fashion industry had asked me if I wanted to become the creative director for his brand, which I obviously said yes. I thought, right, this is my chance to dive into this industry. Um, and this is maybe, you know, my chance to start chasing this dream. Um, so I did, and there I was in London with no money. I still just had maybe two changes of clothes because I never went back home to grab stuff. He was like, cool, um, you start tomorrow. Never had any place to stay. I was basically homeless in London with no money. I was in my overdraft, I was minus, I was in debt. So I was either sleeping at either on his floor or at his grand's, or we would sneak into the office and I would sneak into the office and sleep there. Um, and then it just shows how desperate I was for this career and for this life that I'm now leading now and the life ahead where I'm still trying to reach and I will reach. Um, it was never easy. Um, sleeping on the office floor, freezing on a blow up mattress or just crushed down cardboard uh, or sleeping on my boss's floor. Um, but. I just knew that I needed to do all of this to get the experience, um, get more knowledgeable in business, uh, in the fashion industry, um, and just networking in such a big city with me being from Methil, surrounded just by schemes. We were never introduced to certain lifestyles, so I took that opportunity and I was down there for just over a year, I believe. I think it was just over a year. I remember when I was working for these brands, um, we had a photo shoot set up in New York and again, I had no money. I went to New York for five nights with 90 quid, 90 quid cash. I had to just eat McDonald's maybe once a day or whatever it is, because I was, again, I was never missing that opportunity. And I feel like there's quite a lot of people growing up now feeling like that to have a certain lifestyle, to have a certain career, that they need to just have everything ready from the start and have everything just given to them or they'll just fall into the good money, but that's not the case to get such a great future. And I say that again where my great future is still to come, um, but to get that great future, you need to start at the very bottom where money isn't accessible. Um, but you're there to gain the experience and build the network and get the contacts. Being in London was probably the best thing that happened to me because I learned how to direct a photo shoot, uh, manage brands, how to market brands, um, how to start designing clothing, how to speak back and forth with manufacturers and basically everything you need to start up a brand. So. When New the New York photo shoot finished, I went straight back to Scotland just to visit family and have a couple of days break. Um, and then I received a text no to go back to London. I had been let go, um, which broke my heart uh, because back then I thought I thought that was it. Life was sorted. I thought London that was me sorted for life basically, but that wasn't the case. But as I say, in life, you need those massive knockbacks and knockdowns to build a character that could be strong enough to maybe handle that in the future because you're constantly going to be knocked down, you're constantly going to be knocked back in life. And I'm glad that I've had all these knockbacks and knockdowns quite early on in life. So when that had happened to me, I had to move back up Scotland. And then that's when I started going out partying non-stop. Um, I would go out with like Dows and the boys at the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and then my mate Cammy, he'd work in hospitality, so he'd be off like during the week. So then I'd go out with him the Sunday night, the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, and I was partying five, six times a week um, for quite a few years. And uh, I ended up falling into that lifestyle, and all I cared about was girls and drink and 
dabbling into some drugs and just the, the lifestyle you should never be living for. Um, of course you need to go out, you should enjoy yourself, but it got to the point where that's all I cared about. I was living like a king, uh, some would say. And at the time, um, I thought I was living like a king. Um, and especially just the lifestyle. Again, I wasn't, I was never addicted to the drink. I was never addicted to the drugs, but I was addicted to the lifestyle. Um, all I wanted to do was just get up, get ready, go out, party, drink, take the occasional drugs and again just be surrounded by the girls. Like that's all I fucking lived for. And it sounds sad seeing it back, it does. Um, thinking back it, it looks sad as well. But at the time, I feel like everybody kind of goes through a similar stage. Maybe just no to the extreme where it's five, six times a week um, for a number of years, but that lifestyle ended up driving me into depression. And then eventually, it all caught up with me. I remember after a certain night out, where I did have alcohol, I did take drugs, I was surrounded by the girls. I woke up feeling weird. And I mean weird, man. I felt like I wasn't alive. I started living in third person. And then that's when I realised what deep depression was. Um, severe anxiety, majorly paranoid. Um, and dealing with depression, anxiety and paranoia all at once at a maximum level nearly finished me, which I'm going to talk deeper into now. And I just, I just remember every morning I'd wake up and my heart would be pounding my heart would be racing, um, my palms would start to sweat, I would start to feel like disorientated and dizzy and just, it was like I was on a trip, but this trip lasted like six months. Um, I was bed bound for months upon months. Um, I remember trying to force myself to walk to the shop and I'd like wake up in the shop, I'd black out constantly. Uh, and then I remember I would get to the point where I was that scared for my life. A few months into this mad experience that, by the way, I've never heard anybody experience what I'm speaking about. I've never, I've heard people speak about depression. I've heard people speak about anxiety and stuff like that. But what I'm about to explain, I've tried Googling it. I've tried to understand it and I've never, ever seen or heard it because I remember it got to the point where I'd be sitting up in my bed and I'd be paranoid, I'd be freaking out and then I'd start hallucinating and I'd feel like the room was spinning. Bearing in mind, I've been sober at this point for months. I've just been bed bound for months. I've been depressed, anxiety, everything would just be spinning. I'd be like looking into like weird dimensions. It sounds fucking weird. And then I'd remember I'd switch and I'd be third person standing up looking at myself and I'd be looking at myself sitting on my bed with a vest on sweating like wet hair sweating worrying thinking I was going to die feeling like I maybe need to check myself into a mental hospital feeling like I was turning into a psychopath I was losing my mind um, I was certainly losing my mind and I was petrified man I was scared I used to cry every single fucking night uh, it was the worst experience of my life and for that, for that experience to last all those months, I thought it was, I thought it was the end, man. Um, to the point where I remember, I've never been religious and I never believed in God. I feel like especially where we grew up, you're never really pushed towards that stuff, but now, 100% I believe in God because after all those months thinking I was losing my mind and hallucinating and looking at myself third person every single fucking morning and night, crying myself to sleep, non-stop crying, non-stop scared, petrified for my life, I thought this needs to end. 
And then that's when I realised I've had enough and I was never in a mental state to live. And that's why I know now why some people do take their life due to mental illnesses. Because I feel like I was so close to that and I remember after all those months of experiencing this shit, I thought, fuck it man, I'm done. I'm too scared to live, man. And then I went to bed that night. I thought, tomorrow's the day. Tomorrow's the day it all ends, man. No more fucking suffering. No more being fucking scared. But that night I thought, I've tried everything. The only thing I've not done is pray and fucking beg to God. So I did. I got my knees in a fucking bag, man. I've never told the real truth why I'm sober and why I've been sober for three years or three and a half years. It's because of all that. The drink, the drugs, everything just led me into this spot where I seen myself begging God for another chance. And I says to God, man, I was like, I'm gonna end it tomorrow, man. Like, God, if you exist, and it all led to this point uh, where I was begging God for another chance and I remember on my knees begging, asking if God's out there, man, if you exist, please fucking, please fucking save my life. Or it's done tomorrow, tomorrow I'm, do I'm done, I'm finished. And the reason I'm sober and have been for three years is because I says to God, if you save my life, <laughs> and we carry on this journey, I'll never drink again, I'll never smoke again. I'm done with everything, man, I'm done with that whole, I'm done with everything. And then the next morning, I woke up 1% better. And I thought that can never, ever be a fucking coincidence. It can't be a coincidence that I could spend all those months suffering, <laughs> leading to the point for me to end it all and for me to pray and beg God for that one chance and a return to where I'll never drink or smoke again and then everything just got slightly better that next day. I was still struggling but I felt hope um, and when I woke up uh, it was when I realised like this shit is never a, this shit is not a coincidence man. Like, I believe God listened and he provided, man, and that's why now I believe in God and that's why now I'm sober uh, and I'll never drink and I'll never smoke a cigarette again in my fucking life because the only thing I fear now is God. Because what if I go away behind that, have a fag or have a drink or get drunk or go back to full-time smoking and that whole experience comes back I would never wish that experience on my worst enemy, so I would never want to experience it again myself. Um, and that's the reason I'm sober. But going through that whole experience for those months and, be, and being bedbound and living in that dark light, that's when my life was on pause. That's the months that I was able to reflect on everything uh, and think about my biggest brother uh, and think about why was I misbehaving at certain points in life? Why was I gone doing that certain lifestyle? Why was I constantly wanting to party? And that's when I started realising maybe I was just going through all of that and trying to keep myself busy. To try and push back everything about my biggest brother. Um, and then for months and months I realised when I got 1% better I goes, right, I'm still struggling, but every day is getting slightly better. I had a couple months. I goes, I need to get my life sorted. If I got a second chance, I need to smash this shit, man. So that's when I started plotting. That's when I started planning. And I came up with Legan, Legan Goods, my business, my clothing brand.
Lagan's the second half of my surname. And what Lagan means to me is it's the saviour of something that's wrecked. And at that point in my life, I was the wreckage. I was wrecked. And I was hoping that Lagan would save my life as well. It gave me a purpose. So after months of planning, I started chasing my dream. From chasing my dream in my early 20s, and then going through that traumatic experience, my dreams then started coming true. Uh, after a while we were building the, the groundworks, everything just started happening perfectly. And it wasn't by mistake. Um, I was working my arse off, my whole team, my boys, Begsy, Dows, Kami, Gaz, my mum, my dad, my brother, Reese, everybody that's close in my circle understands, knows all the secrets and knows exactly what I was plotting, what I was planning. The way I was playing the public for me to start building a name for myself and then being on social media and proper chasing at this time, it's when life changed. So then this takes us to the whole chocolate cream thing. Um, everybody in Scotland knows that situation. Uh, I was on TikTok talking about my Starbucks order and then that whole thing blew up and then that was me sort of looking up to God or the universe or whatever it was man thinking this is the opportunity. I've got two choices at this point. I ignore it because people are trying to take the piss at me or I grab this opportunity by the nuts and I run with it and I thought well if I ignore it I'm going to be hoping that I get another opportunity like this, but in a more positive light. I thought, fuck it, man, I'm running with it. So I started diving into that chocolate cream shit. I started exaggerating my accent. I started exaggerating certain characters. I started getting people to tweet about me. I'd screenshot their tweets. I'd put it on my Instagram story to encourage more people to tweet because they wanted to be in my Instagram story. And I was just playing the public. After maybe six months, people started clocking on. Only the smart people started clocking on, like, Kaz is like, got everybody on strings, and I did. I was just, I felt like I was sitting there on my throne, just playing every single hater that was trying to take the piss at me, but really they were just opening up more opportunities for me. They were making me more money. They were getting me more sales at Lagan. Um, and everything was just amazing. I started getting noticed in public, and some of you might already know the story as well. When I was younger, I used to always say to my mom and dad, one day I'm going to be stopped for photos. One day I'm going to be that guy that gets recognised. But again, as I say, growing up, surrounded by schemes in the area that we're from, that's not really an option. But here I was, it happened. Gone out in Edinburgh. People shouting for me, running down the street to see me. Gone to certain festivals, being swarmed, being surrounded. And then that's when I realised everything I've been through, all the fucking struggles, it's all came to this man. And I'll forever be grateful. And then a TV opportunity came up, Love in the Flesh. And I thought, that might not be massive. I understood that. But it's an experience and an opportunity where I could then tell my kids about. Um, and I just knew it was going to be fun. I never take social media, I never take anything too serious, apart from obviously my, my missions that I've spoke about previously. So I thought, fuck it man, I'm gonna jump on. So I jumped on Loving the Flesh, I had the TV opportunity, which I predicted, I remember, maybe it was the first episode of Riley's Gaff podcast, I said to them, I predicted a few things. I said on that, I will be on TV and I will go into schools and inspire the kids, which I've pr previously said, uh, both of those things have happened. And trust me, I'll be back on TV. I also started getting opportunities for club appearances. Um, obviously I don't drink or nothing, nothing like that, but I thought, this is unreal. Like I get to go out, bring my boys, have an amazing time, me being sober, but my boys all had their drinks and had a blast. And I'm now at the point where I'm getting paid four figures over a grand to just be in a nightclub for like three hours. I thought life changed pretty quickly 
but people forget the seven plus years prior to the hard work I was trying to get here, struggling in London, having nowhere to stay in London, being broke, all of those things was me working hard, laying the groundworks to be where I am today. And it's still just the start. As I said previously as well, everybody's got a dream when they're 10. When you're 10 years old, you want the certain cars, you want the certain houses, you want the certain career. And in reality, slowly fucking brainwashes you into thinking that that's unachievable. And my mission is to keep that 10 year old Kaz Milligan happy. I will have the yellow Lamborghini. I will have the mansions. I'll have everything I ever wished for and dreamt for. And I know those things, those things are not important in life. I know that for a fact happiness is. Especially what I've been through emotionally and mentally. Happiness is the only thing that really matters in life. But if you've got a dream when you're 10, don't let go. And even if you have let go, go back and grab it. And I've got a quote, the Kaz Milligan quote, you've maybe heard me say before. You want to create a book and a movie, not a magazine and an episode. Meaning you want your journey to last as long as you can for it to be an inspiring story. If you blow up in the period of a year or two with no setbacks and downfalls, Nobody's going to watch or read that story and be inspired. But I've had all these traumatic experiences, knockbacks, setbacks, came up, came down, already in just this short period of time. I'm on my journey to create that book and a movie. So, if you think Kaz was done, think again, man. You've only seen the first few chapters.